one of those that's like really difficult to overstate because the reality is that pretty much anything that you're measuring as a brand, as a marketer, as a sales professional, like trust is a precursor. People aren't going to download from places and companies they don't trust. They're not going to schedule a call with somebody they don't trust. They're not going to buy a product and give their credit card information to somebody they don't trust. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Melanie Diesel. If you don't know who Melanie is, you need to know Melanie. Uh, author of Content Fuel Framework. She's also the co-founder of The Convoy, a B2B marketplace that helps small businesses save money through aggregated buying power. Her latest book is called Prove It, Exactly How Modern Marketers Earn Trust. Melanie, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. It's good to catch up. I'm super excited to have you here today. Melanie, I, Melanie and I are going to explore how to establish trust uh, online. So first question for you is... Um, why is trust so important as we're recording this in late 2022? And some people are going to be listening to this in 2023 and in the future. Like, yeah. like talk to me about trust and why this is so important right now. Yeah. I guess like trust has always been important, you know, like as a general rule, you know, we know this in our personal lives, but I think what we've seen, especially over the last, you know, few years is that uh, it, it's a very skeptical marketplace that we're operating in. Consumers are so jaded when it comes to, you know, who, who they should trust and who's going to follow through. You know, they're spending a lot more time looking at reviews. And, you know, the studies have shown repeatedly that, you know, less than 5% of people feel like marketers are practicing integrity. You know, there's, there's a lot of skepticism, a lot of fear that, you know, they're going to get, they're going to get scammed. You know, that there's, there's just a lot of lying going on. And some of that comes from like, you know, the reckoning we've had with Photoshop and, you know, body image and things like that in, in the more like visual advertising space. But it just kind of ties into this general feeling of like, there's a lot of scam artists out there. I don't know who I can trust. And so it's never been more important as a brand, as a marketer, as a, cons you know, as a, a company of any kind to make sure that you are showing that you are trustworthy. Because even if you feel like everything you're doing is on the up and up, you know, consumers just, I mean, they don't know that. And if, if we don't prove it, they have no reason to believe us over, you know, the Nigerian lottery in our email inbox or the, you know, car warranty uh, phone calls that we're getting. Well, and if you think about it, there has been some big influencers who have essentially, quote unquote, pitched products that turned out to be scams, right? We, like we think of the Fry Festival, right? Yeah, yeah, the Fry Festival. Or however they say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all these other, you know, influencers, quote unquote, out there that are just They've been paid a small amount of money and they're just going out and saying, this is amazing. And now consumers, everyday people who are viewing this content or reading this content now have a little bit of skepticism. How do I know this is real? How do I know this isn't a scam? How do I know I can even trust? As a matter of fact, most of the stuff we see on social media these days isn't even from friends anymore, right? Right. It's from people we don't even know who the heck they are. Yeah. Like about TikTok and Reels, it's all about just random YouTube people that come up. So I would imagine it's only going to become more important also because it's so easy for anyone to create content, right? Well, yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, I think that's part of the skepticism too, is like, we all know, you know, with a couple hours and a couple bucks, you can spin up a website, social media platforms, a logo and make something look really legit. Uh, so, you know, it's easy to get conned in. I mean, nobody's proud of it happening, but it happens to all of us. Like most people have a story of, you know, I ordered a product and it never came or, you know, I thought it was the real brand website, but there was a typo in the URL and they're very clever at copying, you know, things like that happen all the time. So it's, it's important, you know, people are going to continue to look for those things and just become more and more aware. When you do it right, and we're going to talk a little bit about it later, what's the upside? Talk to me about the upside when done well. I mean, this is one of those that's like really difficult to overstate because the reality is that pretty much anything that you're measuring as a brand, as a marketer, as a sales professional, like trust is a precursor. People aren't going to download from places and companies they don't trust. They're not going to schedule a call with somebody they don't trust. They're not going to buy a product and give their credit card information to somebody they don't trust, right? So when you go that extra mile, when you're providing proof through content, you're really giving yourself a leg up on anything else that you're doing as an organization. So I don't mean to sound dramatic by saying like everything is at stake, you know, like <laughs> the world, your entire future is at stake. Um, but truthfully, you know, you, you should start to see that when you're doing a better job of establishing that trust, 
honestly, most of your metrics, most of your key performance indicators, you should start to see over time rolling benefits there where the more people trust you, the more loyal they're going to become, the more they they are going to recommend you to others. You know, it's going to continue to impact all of your, your, your business and your growth down the line. Well, and I love that because it's true that um, this concept of no like trust we talk about in marketing, we've been talking about it forever. People do business yeah. with those whom they know they like and they trust, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I might know you and like you, but if I don't trust you, I can guarantee I'm not giving you a dollar. Not a chance. <laughs> and I might not even give you my email, to be honest, right? Like, I'm not even going to opt in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll give some sort of uh, email that is like a, a trash email that you don't care about because you don't yep. trust yet. You haven't established that trust. So if there's a way we can actually um, positively establish trust in this era where distrust seems to be the predisposition, the, st the, the state of normalcy, you yeah. know, then so much can happen. So let's talk about your strategy. What is at a high level, the strategy that we as marketers need to be thinking about when it comes to establishing trust? So, you know, at, uh, what we call it is essentially the prove it method, right? And we've I've hinted at this a little bit. What we're talking about is the fact that if you are out there making claims as a business owner, as a marketer, you know, you need to be backing those claims up. You need to be providing proof because just saying it is not enough anymore. So essentially what you want to be doing is looking through the lens of all the content you're creating and, and truthfully auditing the content you've already created in all forms to say, what am I claiming? What am I saying that I will do? What am I saying that I have experience with? What am I saying that I will perform the uh, results that I will get them? You know, what are all those promises, guarantees, claims that you are making? And are you providing enough evidence to allow someone to actually trust that it's true? Because I think the general mindset for the last while, you know, last many years has been, well, if I tell them that I'm the greenest or the most, you know, most sustainable, I'm the longest running, the most trusted, that that's enough, right? Like I've told them, don't worry, I'm, I'm the most trusted. But now people are asking according to who, like most trusted for what, right? There's follow-up questions. And so we need to provide the proof that goes beyond just making these claims. And it's kind of a mindset shift of, you know, making sure that, you're, you're backing these things up and not just letting, you know, copy run away and, and get, you know, really throw in lots of adjectives, lots of promises in there about how wonderful you are. You've actually got to be providing the follow-up proof. Got it. Okay. So it's called the prove it method. And um, we were talking before and we were prepping for this, that there's three different steps or stages or types. So let's start with the very first one. What is it? And let's dive in a little bit. Yeah. So the first one is corroboration. So to corroborate your content, uh, your claims. So basically when you create content that corroborates, and again, content can be copy on your website. It can be social copy. It can be anything, right? Anywhere that you're communicating with your audience, you want to be backing it up with other people's opinions, right? So the two examples, the most common kind would be like an expert. So that's someone outside of your organization who has experience, degrees, awards, broad recognition as like, this is a person who knows what they're talking about on this subject. Get them to add a quote, get them to back you up, to endorse you, to be an influencer, find a way to get outside experts to validate whatever it is you're saying. And then the other way you can corroborate, the other way you can add in other voices to back up what you're saying is to go for more of like a witness approach. So they're not necessarily experts. You know, they're not like, uh, you know, professors or researchers or industry giants. They're everyday people who have seen you do what you say you're going to do. So that could be like clients, customers, uh, your employees. You know, it depends on the claim that you're making. But the question to ask there is like, who has experienced this being true? Because those are the folks who are going to be able to give, whether it's testimonials or customer stories or reviews, they're going to be able to say, look, they're not blowing smoke. Like they really did do this for me. I really did get those results or they really do benefit. And that's going to go a long way toward making sure it's not just you saying, you know, trust me, take my word for it. Here's what we do. You've got other folks, experts and witnesses chiming in to back you up. This is kind of interesting because uh, looking at the books, for those that are watching the video behind you, we can see that you've got a couple of books there. Yeah. And my is you might have a quote on the cover of one of those books from someone who's well-known. And if you don't, I can tell you I do on one of my books, you know, and this idea of um, reaching out to someone who's known mm -hmm. to be in the industry and getting their quote and sticking it on the cover because Guy Kawasaki, for example, is on the cover of one of my books. That's and a good one. 
Seth Godin, you know, is inside the the flop on some of my books, right? So the idea here is that we kind of understand this from a marketing perspective, because like if you think about how people used to buy books, they'd walk into a store, mm-hmm. look at the cover of the book, and if they saw something that attracted them, they would open up the book. First mm-hmm. thing they would typically see is the rest of the testimonials yep. from people that they may not know, but underneath them, it would say who they are, what company yep. they founded, right? So this is kind of a tried and true methodology, is it not? Mm-hmm. It really is. And I think it's something we think about, you know, as an author, you know, one of the blanks you have to fill is like, whose name is going on the cover? Who's going to help me sell this thing? But I think we don't know. Ne- have that same mindset or that same focus when we're putting out a blog post or we're running a new campaign or, you know, you're putting together a video of how well your event went this year. You know, we don't necessarily always think of bringing in an expert to back us up on those things. Um, and, and it's something we can do on a more regular basis, not just for the special, you know, once every other year book releases. Um, do you have any tips on how in the world to get the experts to give you the quotes? And also, do you have some examples? Let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah. So my recommendation, honestly, is always to look for academics who can weigh in on it. You know, folks who are professors, researchers, you know, professor emeritus, like someone who who is in academia. And the reason this works well, uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is these folks have chosen by far the least paying version of whatever their profession is because they care about educating people. So these are folks who are generally like passionate about sharing their knowledge and and talking to people about their topic of expertise. Um, But also, especially if they're at a public university, their contact information is usually pretty easy to track down, you know, whether it's on like a, a staff page or a faculty page, they may have a faculty profile on the school site where you can see their email or their phone number. So I think, you know, academics are some of the most generous with their knowledge and time and easy to track down. So that's always my first recommendation if you're looking for experts to weigh in. So talk about when we use customer testimonials versus when we use expert testimonials, because I can imagine there's different reasons to use each one, right? Um, Yeah. And I would imagine in some regards, one might be even more powerful than the other. Like my gut tells me that if it's on a sales page, and there's an actual customer who experienced the product, that's going to be way more powerful than some expert saying, Melanie Diesel's the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you're onto something there. And I think experience is the exact right word to use. So if you are talking about an experience, then the most, you know, the best qualified person to speak to that is someone who's had that experience. So that's where the customer, client, employees, et cetera, come into play. Because like they've been there, they know that it's true because they experienced it. When you're talking about information and you need them, you know, I'm saying to you that this is an important thing for your business. Here's an expert who's also saying it's important for your business. You know, it's great if you also have a customer who says this was very important for my business when I worked with them. That's the experience. But that information, that fact, it's often better to have um, more of a, a qualified expert weigh in on those things. Um, but I will say it's it's really difficult to find a place where having someone, whether it's an expert or a witness, weigh in on something is not helpful, right? Because at the end of the day, anything else that's not being corroborated is just like, take my word for it, right? So in general, take whoever you can get to back you up, to corroborate you on these things. But yeah, if you're talking about experiences that that people have had, then, you know, those witnesses, those customers and clients are going to be your best bet. Do you have any examples of clients or businesses that you think are doing this really well that people might want to just think about? You know, I think when you look at B2B companies, especially, they do a really good job. And, you know, I'm sure there are exceptions out there. But as a general rule, if you look at the sales page on a B2B uh, service provider of any kind, you know, a SaaS company, especially, you will find so many witness testimonials, right? So they're going to come in and they're going to tell you, uh, you know, this helped our productivity 15%. Our our sales at such and such company, you know, were so much higher the first quarter we used them. You'll find plenty of that. Um, but generally, you will also find at least one expert way in. And it tends to be a non-human expert, like a study or a research thing where they're like, uh-huh. studies have shown that, you know, change, you know, following up uh, with customers as quickly as possible increases such and such, right? So, they're also giving you like science backs the way that we're doing this this thing or the the process we're helping you do um, that kind of thing. You you generally find a pretty good combination on B two B and especially SaaS sales pages. 
And for all of our B2C friends, because there's a big chunk of them listening, um, yeah. I mean, you see it in like uh, cosmetics and oh, yeah. related stuff. But what about all the other industries? They have an opportunity here, don't they? A huge opportunity. And like I said, I think that um, B2B, we're kind of conditioned. We always need to say like, we've helped a company like you. Like that's a pretty common proof point you need to make. So this happens a lot there. But any B2C, I think you're in the same the same boat, you know, especially if it's a, an industry where trust is really important. So you know, anything heavily regulated, anything with big risks, you know, finance, insurance, pharma, you know, any of those things, medical, where people are making big, important decisions or, or very high price point decisions, then the more testimonials, the more, you know, corroboration you can bring in, uh, the hopefully the better it's going to be. And I think um, speaking to your customers is is a great way to figure out who they would trust. You know, if you're like, I don't know who the trusted person is in insurance sales, you know, I don't know who the, who the big voice is. Like, your customers probably do. Who would they trust? Yeah. And, you know, let's just say that maybe you're not a really expensive product, but maybe let's say you're one of the more expensive products in your category, right? Like, let's say you mm-hmm. have premium coffee, for example, right? Yep. And you cost yep. twice as much as everybody else's coffee. Well, then you're going to need a heck of a lot of coffee experts to say, mm-hmm. well, there's something special about where this coffee is sourced from. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe even customers saying this is the best cup of coffee they've ever had, maybe even on video, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, an an expert can go a long way there, too, right? To say that, you know, studies show that if there's fewer parts per million of such and such, you know, acidity, then, you know, it's going to taste this much better or cause less heartburn. I don't know. I'm not I'm not a coffee expert, uh, apparently. But, uh, you know, or or that, you know, we have this proof that fair trade beans, you know, are better for the local economy. And so, you know, getting them sourced from here is better for for this place as well as for us. Um, I think those kinds of things can can really go a long way, You, you know. Even if even if you're not the most expensive in your category, you know, really just trying to say that there's a reason for all these things that we're doing. And here's here's some of those reasons. Awesome. So we talked about co- corroboration, which is a bit of a tongue twister, right? It is. Which it is. is. <laughs> Expert witnesses and general uh, experts and witnesses, yeah. Experts and witnesses, okay. Yeah. So, what's the second part of the process? The second one is documentation. So, the way I like to think of it is this: the corroboration is like they hear it, they're hearing it from someone else, a witness, and and you know, oh, it doesn't have to be hearing literally audio, but you know, they're hearing the the voice of someone else uh, backing you up. Documentation is really about seeing it. Right. So it's really about showing them so that they don't have to take anyone's word for it. They can experience it themselves. Um, And we do that in a couple different ways through stories and through documentation Um, or, you know, through documentation. So that would be. um, Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, our our example of the call, I'll I'll keep rolling with the coffee thing. I don't know why, because I'm not a coffee expert, but here we go. Um, So stories would be maybe if you're, again, trying to point out the coffee's more expensive because we we do it fair trade and, you know, we treat our workers better than anyone else. Then you want to find one of those farmers who can tell the story of like, look, here we are on my farm. Like I'm able to pay my workers a better wage and, you know, we're healthier. We have better cleaning standards. Like show them, let them see it. and then documentation uh, would be the same thing, typically showing a process. So this might be um, the show how it's made is like my favorite example of this, right? Where you can like watch a process happen and you're like, well, that clearly looks like safe or clean or detailed or whatever else, right? You, you witness it yourself. Um, and the other great example of, of documentation to like show it um, is to is to demonstrate it with like how... Um, like an infomercial does, you know, you have those like side by side comparisons where you have like, it absorbs times as much water and they like dunk both of them into a tub of water. And then you can, you can clearly see with your own eyeballs that like this one still has a ton of water left and this one absorbed all of it. Um, so maybe an infomercial side by side is not always the way to go, um, depending on your product, but you can also do like a checkbox matrix version of this. Like here's the things that we do and here's the things that they do, or here's the differences between the things we do. It's really just kind of showing, uh, allowing them again to see it with their own eyes. How can I let them experience this so that they don't have to take anyone's word for it? I love this. Um, Chipotle, uh, a while back, um, decided they were going to go fully like organic with all of their food. Mm -hmm. And they started actually taking video crews to the farms where they actually source the materials from. Yep. And they were telling like short little two minute videos about Mm -hmm. like, um, where the beans are coming from, for example. 
right? Yeah. Um, or where the avocados are coming from, just to kind of give people a little bit of the behind the scenes that like they source them from like legit places. Mm -hmm. And these are real small local farmers, generally speaking, where they source yeah. like stuff from. And I think that's an example of a story. Um, how else could we use story? Do we have to use our vendors as part of the story? Could we use our employees as part of the story? Talk to me a little bit about that. A hundred percent. I think it really depends on the claim that you're making. Um, you know, one great example, since I've got coffee on the brain, um, Starbucks makes a point of emphasizing how well they treat employees in many cases, right? That they provide uh, funds to help you go back to school, that they pay higher than minimum wage, all these sorts of things. So if you're trying to prove out that claim, like, no, it really is a good place to work. It's not just lip service. Then, you know, telling the story of one of your employees who then went back to school and now, you know, they've maybe they've moved on somewhere else and you were able to enable that, you know, new life path for them. Uh, talking about a veteran who, you know, you've been able to to bring back into the workforce, you know, given the challenges they may have been facing um, by showing those stories. You know, it's your employees that you're talking about, but it's really making a case not only to potential employees, but, you know, showing your values a little bit like here's here's how we take care of our people. You know, you know, I see a lot of Internet marketing people using the stories of their customers, you mm -hmm. know, where they'll ask a customer, like, what was your experience before you use this service or product yeah. and what is it now? Yeah, you think those are super effective also. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think you make a good point. Sometimes people bring up like, well, what's the difference between like a witness and then a story, right? If I have my customers as a witness or customers as a story. And I think the difference is often the level of depth that you're going to. Um, if I'm telling a story in general about how great my product is, and I've got a little quote that says, Johnny so-and-so customer agreed that this was the, a great purchase for them or something. That's different than here's the story of Johnny and what they were doing beforehand and how it wasn't working and what they're doing now and why it's different and what was at stake in that decision. And here's a photo of them enjoying that result, you know, really going into some depth and telling a story versus just a little sneak peek with a quote or a snippet. One thing that we did at Social Media Examiner, which is kind of fun that I think other people could model, is that we did a contest where we asked people who attended social media marketing world to go ahead and create a video talking about how it transformed their business. Nice. The winner was going to get a free ticket to the conference that they could use for themselves or give to a friend. Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up embedding the winning video on our testimonials page, you know, which there you is go. An awesome example of how this guy's Roger Wakefield, who's a plumber out of Texas, how his life was completely transformed as a result of walking into social media marketing world and walking out with a new YouTube channel that blew up. And and then he went on to be like one of the most recognized plumbers in America, you know, and he started this it. trade stuff. And and like that's a that's a fun way you can incentivize someone. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of anything like that where you maybe just encourage people to do something like that? No, but I think that UGC, like user generated content like that is a really smart way to gather stories. Um, what I have seen a lot of is people finding stories on social media. So maybe like someone tags them in a post or something and they're like, wait, this is genius. Like have our team reach out to them. We got to get more detail. We got to get photos, right? We see that. Um, but I actually like that you kind of flipped it on its head and you're like, give us your stories. And I think if you're in a position where you have a big enough audience that you can ask that of, um, or particularly, I mean, I will say you had a little bit of a head start there because everyone who was there knew the value of creating that kind of content and probably now had access to the knowledge and tools to do it. Right. Uh, that may have been tougher for the plumber to do himself to set, email all of his customers and say, send me a video of how great your toilet is now. You know, like, <laughs> that may not have uh, have been quite as fruitful. But however, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some people at the end uh, that that would that would uh, if they're smart, you show up on site and you pull out your camera and you just say, tell me what your challenge is. And at yep. the end, you you videotape them again. How do you feel now? All of a sudden yeah. you've got the content in exchange for giving them a discount or something like that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I think this is also a spot where you may be able to take a lesson from journalism. Um, you know, my background is as a journalist and we were often having to ask people questions about things that they might not want to talk about. Like, you know, I imagine if you're in pest control, for example, you may have a tough time getting people to like 
admit that they had an infestation or something like that, right? Or when you're in healthcare and people may not want to talk about their personal health issues. Um, one of the things we find is asking people um, how much they are comfortable talking about and letting them guide the conversation. So sometimes when you ask really pointed questions, like if you were to say, tell me how horrible your life was when you had your bed bug infestation, like you might you might not get a response. Like, <laughs> you know, it's probably not going to be super productive. But if you could say, talk to me about what it's like to worry about bugs in your home, like give them something general, like talk to me about or tell me a story about, or can you share more about something pretty general? And they'll often kind of bring those details up on their own in a way that they're more comfortable with. Yeah, and I would imagine if you had to, you could just have a recorder with you and just say, I'm recording this anonymously for research, you know? Yep. And then afterwards, you could potentially get their permission to not use their name, but their voice. And then you can put B-roll over the top of it. And all of a sudden, yeah. you have something kind of fascinating. Now, I want to ask you about, you know, we're talking about documentation and this matrix thing fascinated me because we've been running split tests on our sales page. Mm -hmm. And we found that when we added a matrix that says, um, this is how we do conferences and this is how most of the other ones do them with checklists and stuff mm -hmm. that really did positively move the needle. Why yeah. does that work? I mean, I think it's because we're kind of like doing the homework for them, right? Like when we, when we list out all the things that are wonderful about us, the only way they're going to come to that same conclusion as they would with the checkbox comparison is if they also went to the other websites, many of them probably, and then had that all in their head. Like they remembered all the facts about all these other competitors. So when you're doing the comparison side by side with a checklist like that or with some other sort of comparison method and you're putting it all in one spot, you make it easy for them to make, like you're doing the homework for them. They can look at that graphic or look at that comparison and say, well, obviously one of these is better than the other. I no longer have to do the research. I no longer have to go to a bunch of other websites and price compare or, you know, comparison shop, look at the different specs. Like it's right here. They made it easy for you. And even if you may not come out as far ahead in that kind of comparison, the fact that you've made it easy is also brownie points for you. Like, wow, clearly this is an, an organization that cares about their customers, that wants to make things easy, that's honest and transparent. Like, it goes a long way. So we've been talking about this second category, which is demonstration. Mm -hmm. uh, and documentation is part of demonstration. Yep. Is there other ways that we can demonstrate? Like, I could imagine like a... Um, I've seen these kind of things like you kind of mentioned it. Like if you ever watch Shark Tank, you know, they do this yep. a lot, right? They do an mm -hmm. actual demonstration. But yeah. I would imagine you could do the same thing with illustrations or yeah. explainer videos. What are your thoughts on that kind of stuff? Yeah. So that starts to get into the third category, the third type of content, um, which is yeah, education. So, so before we go there, then what is documentation <laughs> outside of just stories? Do you understand? I just want to make sure. Yeah. I got yeah. That so. So demonstration has the two different categories. The first is stories where you're telling someone's story and then it's the documentation. Like this is bringing the receipts, right? So this is showing the side by side, wow. um, like in the infomercial, this is, um, you know, I don't know if you've had an audit and you release the audit results or you do an analysis, you know, some sort of data that says, look, we, we punched in all the numbers and like, here's how it came out. Here's how we measured up, um, an assessment, an award, like anything that just is like, evidence that they can evaluate themselves to say like, oh, all right, well, that that seems to make sense. I can see I can see that now. OK, so we've got this first category, which is cooperation, which is really like um, testimonials, for lack of better words. Mm -hmm. And we've got the second category, which is demonstration through stories and documentation. And this third mm -hmm. one is is education. So uh, I always say, you know, the first one, the corroborating is getting someone else to say it so they hear it. The middle one is our demonstration. And this is where uh, we're allowing them, the audience to see it themselves. And then the third one, education, is where we help them know it. Right. So education, uh, there's really two types of content you can use as proof here. Uh, the first one is just information. Sometimes like straight up, our audience does not have enough information or understanding or experience to know how to assess whether our claims are true. So a great example of this is if you're in any kind of space where people don't make this purchase many times. Um, so, well, hopefully you think of like um, uh, a, if you're in the wedding industry, right? Like Many times you're dealing with first time customers. They've never had to plan a wedding before. They have no clue how much catering or flowers or whatever else costs, right? You got to get them up to speed. Here's the average budget of this kind of project. You know, here's 
uh, some of the questions to consider as you're deciding what's the right path for you, right? You're giving them information that says like, look, I know what I'm talking about and I know all of this stuff, but I know that you may need more information in order to evaluate whether my claims are true. Am I really affordable? Well, you don't know unless you know what others cost, right? You, unless you know what the average budget is. So, so what, are, what, are, what are you calling that, uh, that thing you just talked about with these within the wedding scenario, did you, do you have a label for this? Is that just general education on what goes into a wedding? Uh, so I don't, I guess I don't have a name for that specific type. That was just an off the cuff example, but yeah, specifically if you are in a space where most of your customers are first time customers, that's something you're going to, you're going to want to rely on heavily. Um, another, another category where this just like straight up informational content is super valuable is if your buyer is not your end user. So, you know, I may be buying, you know, I may be engaging your services for tech for my company, but I'm not the technical guy. I'm just the guy signing the checks. You know what I mean? So I need you to explain to me why it's important to have two factor authentication or, you know, an SSL certificate or whatever else. I don't know what those things are. Are they even important? Like you got to help me figure it out because I'm not the one who's going to be implementing or understanding it at the end. I mean, I like this a lot. And, um, I mean, obviously, this is right in the wheelhouse of a lot of content marketers, right? Um, you talked about coaching. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit, too, because it sounds almost like the example you gave with the wedding planner could be potentially a coach a little bit. Yeah. Talk about how that works. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a fine line. And I always say the the issue for me is less which category something falls into and more that these categories are helpful for you thinking of, of ways you might do it, right? So information is usually like, I'm giving you this information. You can do with it what you will. Uh, coaching is usually a little more hands-on and this content is helping them through a process. So I would say with that example before, the informational is like, here's what the average budget is for these kinds of things. The more coaching might be, here's the questions to ask. Like, I understand you're going through a process and I'm going to give you the information to do that. Um, it could also be anything step by step. So recipes, how to instructions, um, you know, how to, how to make a budget for your wedding, right? That would be more uh, on the coaching side of things. Like I'm going to give you things to guide you along your journey and that through that process, you'll come to trust us more. You know, as, as I'm thinking this through, especially more complex sales, mm -hmm. you think about how people will offer a free audit mm -hmm. or they'll offer a free coaching session if they're yep. a coach, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this gives you a taste, if you will. Yep. Can this be done with content or because because it's not scalable, obviously, if you have yeah. a massive amount of people. I'm just curious. Is that even an option? Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Um, one of the things that's super helpful in this space, like I said, is anything that's like steps or tutorials, uh, instructions. A lot of times the one of the best ways this works is when you are giving instructions or tutorial for a process, that process will often show this is way too complicated for me and I'm just going to hire them to do it. Right. Like, I'm, I, I don't know. I've had this system a lot where I'm like trying to fix something at home and I'm watching the tutorial and I'm like, you hit a certain point where you're just like, I'm in way over my head. Like I got to call a pro. Um, so that kind of content can actually convert really well when you can show fairly, don't exaggerate. But if you're showing the complexity of something, that can be a great indicator of like, I don't know what this is, but they seem to know what they're doing. So like, let me, let me get them engaged, right? Even yeah. if you're showing them the process. It, this is kind of uh, hearkening back to books again as an example, but yeah. um, white papers even too, right? Like my very first business, well, one of my earlier businesses was I was a writer. Mm -hmm. I wrote a paper called How to Write a White Paper, a white paper on white papers, which yep. I know sounds kind of crazy, but it generated me like 100,000 leads and set wow. my business up. And um, I just taught them the basics and what to look for when looking for a writer. And mm -hmm. of course, I'm the one that checked all the boxes, you know, <laughs> and I told them what the elements of it were. And then eventually I ended up writing a book called Writing White Papers, my first book, mm -hmm. which got me ridiculous amounts of work. And this is where a lot of people um, in our industry understands that, that a book is a great example of educating, but also proving that mm -hmm. you know something, right? Yeah. Because I think you used to be a consultant, if I'm not mistaken, right? I so was. your first book served as true proof, did it not? A hundred percent. Yeah, I was just going to say that was actually, um, so the first book was the Content Fuel Framework. And where that came from, to be honest, all the content in that book um, is came from workshops that I was doing. I was doing these workshops all the time. And a lot of times someone would ask, well, like, hey, do you have like a version of this I can give to my boss or to a colleague or so-and-so? 
and I didn't. It was all just contained in that workshop. And um, there was some hesitation from folks in my circle about like, are you really going to put all the things from your, you know, very expensive corporate workshop into this like $20 book? And it was exactly what we were just talking about. I said, you know, there are going to be folks who could never afford or would never be in a situation to be in the audience for one of those things. And they will have this to try to guide them. And then there are going to be those people who look at it and go, this is great. I'm not doing it. Let's get her in here to do it for us. Right. So um, I wasn't worried about that. Honestly, because, you know, like I said, there's always going to be there's going to be the DIYers and we're never going to buy with you to begin with. Well, and, and to be honest with you, when people are show up, they're ready to buy because this happened to me. I had people lining up waiting months to work with me because of my book. Yeah. And, you know, there's only so many of these white papers I could write a month. But the idea is that by the time they went through this educational process with the book and they mm -hmm. convinced themselves that um, they don't want to do that because that sounds difficult. Yeah. And they want to hire XYZ person, in this case, me. Um, that is the ultimate, ultimate ease. I mean, like you, this is why so many book authors are kind of set as long as it doesn't outdate itself. They could just basically pick up the phone. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. I hate to use that <laughs> analogy, but like, let's take it back to like educational content in general. Like, how does this work into all of our marketing? Like, you know, because this is really kind of the secret sauce, I think, right? I think so. hundred percent. I mean, there's lots of ways that you could work this kind of stuff into your marketing. It often plays a really big role in any SEO that you may be doing. So if you're looking to search optimize, a lot of the content you create is based on the queries of your audience. How, what are people searching for and how are they going to, how are you going to get them to your site for that answer? So we find a lot of educational content, um, you know, and, and coaching content because people are always searching how do I, or how to stuff. Um, you know, we, that kind of content works really well for search as long as you have some sort of, you know, search strategy going on as well. And you're not just arbitrarily creating stuff, although that probably helps a little bit, too. <laughs> so let's kind of sew this all together, you know, because um, it seems to me as if in some cases you could just get away with doing education um, because that proves it. Right. And. Mm -hmm you know, depending on how you do it, if you do it on video, they're going to get to know you. They're going to understand your cadence. They'll tell, they can tell if you're reading the script versus actually being authentic. Yeah. Um, so like tie all three of these together and tell me how they all work collaboratively and sometimes how they might want to work independently of each other. Yeah. So this is not something that you need to do all at once. It's not something where you need to do every single type. Exactly. Like you said, you will find that there are instances where you understand, like, I just need to help them understand this a little bit better. Or the biggest barrier to buying from us is not knowing what to do. So let's educate them on the process. Let's coach them through it, right? Um, other times, people are asking you for more examples. Well, can you can you tell me more? I just, I'm not sure if this is a good fit. Like, that's a good indication that some, some corroboration might be helpful or some demonstration. Show them so that they're convinced. So I think you'll start to see... Once you understand the three the three types of content you can create um, and how they serve to earn that trust, right, by helping them hear it from other people, helping them see it themselves and helping them better understand the claim in the first place, um, you know, you'll start to see which ones are going to be a good fit for certain sales situations. Uh, for certain types of customers, you might use different content for different parts of your segment. Like we often see educational content works really well top of funnel. Uh, and then, you know, as they get further down, they need more of that demonstration and corroboration because they're getting ready to make the decision. So it's more more is at stake, right? So, you, I mean, this stuff can fit in at different parts of your sales process. You can use some for marketing and some for sales, uh, depending on, again, those common objections. That's one of the things that I actually think is, is a great source of what kind of proof you should be creating is to talk to your sales team, whatever that is for your organization. What are the objections that these customer facing people get? What are people worried about or not sure about or misunderstanding? Like that's a good opportunity for you to, to understand like this is a this is a spot where we need to provide more proof. We need to help earn their trust on this particular issue. You know, I'm going to share a little story with you and I want to hear your thoughts on, on yeah. how you would do it because um those that follow me closely know that I have another show called uh, Crypto Business, uh, and I have a conference recording uh, coming up in a couple of weeks as of this recording. Mm -hmm. um, so what I decided to do, first of all, was I, I began to understand uh, very quickly that a big chunk of my audience did not understand what the heck Web3 was and NFTs and social tokens after doing a survey, and they really frankly weren't interested in it, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the first things I did was I started a podcast. 
And I started interviewing people that were way smarter than I am. And then eventually I, I decided to, to do a spaces called Web3 for Beginners on Twitter. And I got a co-host, Heather Parody, and we just assumed everybody was complete beginners. And we brought on people and we just met literally online for an hour, literally for like months. And we just recently ended that. Um, that was all our way of kind of educating. Um, and throughout that educational content, we would say things like, hey, if you want to go deeper, if you want to be early, then we've got this event. You know, then the challenge was um, once we got people to the sales page, we didn't have um, uh, we, we experimented with this quite a bit. There was a lot of people going to the sales page from social media examiner proper that did not understand what Web3 was. Right. So we uh, had the sales page be really educational about what is Web1, Web2, mm -hmm. Web 3 and then eventually we were testing it and we finally came to the point where as we got closer to the event that we had to be a little bit more of a direct selling of the event. We had to use testimonials that, that um, more um, were advocating the, 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 you know, the reputation of social media examiner and myself, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This was new, but we, but we finally figured out the way to do it. We had this, are you new to web three? Click here right mm. up the top of the sales letter. And that's where people could go deeper and kind of get a background on it. But it was a struggle because in this case, we got nobody who's experienced any of our products as we didn't set, it was brand new. Yeah. We were completely riding on the reputation of myself and my company. Um, and I would imagine there's a lot of people listening right now that are like thinking the same thing. They're Maybe it's brand new technology, brand new innovation. Like how do they even do Cause this has been a struggle. I'm not going to lie. Like we didn't yeah. as many as we wanted and, and it's, you know, we're, we're going to have a couple hundred people there. We were hoping for a couple thousand. We're just getting started. We look at this as an investment in the future of the couple hundred who decided to come. Yeah. Uh, it's rough when you don't, when you're not known for this mm -hmm. and you don't have a lot of the kinds of things that we're talking about here because it's totally new, you know, yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah. So I would say in this phase, what you probably want to do is find experts, but not experts necessarily in what you are doing, but experts in their respective areas. So you find someone in real estate who's going to talk about the importance of Web3 for real estate, and that's helping their audience get an expert opinion that this is something to pay attention to. You find someone in uh, sales, you find someone in sports. I don't know what the different categories might be, right? But the places where Web3 is super important, find those category sort of sub-industry experts and have them talk to their audience about how important this is and why it's something relevant to learn about, why it's something they need to be concerned about for their business, um, you know, why it's an opportunity. And by having them share their expert opinion to their audience, it sort of lends that credibility over to you to say, you know, whether they're affiliates or referrals or, you know, paid ads, whatever it is, finding those industry experts outside of your space to kind of refer people in with their expertise is probably a good way to go. Well, and one of the things that we did do is we did get experts on my podcast. Those yes. that listened to the podcast had pretty, plenty of demonstration of that because they yes. could hear the wisdom. Those are the people that are teaching mm -hmm. uh, on the stage. We even sponsored one of the other shows. That's one of the bigger shows, right? And they were advocating yes. for us every day on their show. Um, but I think the big opportunity for someone who's experiencing something like me is once you get the customers and they have a great experience, you capture those testimonials, right? Yeah. For the next time, right? And sometimes this is an investment that's going to take time, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. You make it uh, an awesome point. So you talked about how effective it was for you to ask for those transformational stories from social media marketing world. A very similar approach can work. What, what, how is this changing the way you run your business? What difference do you think attending will make for your business? Uh, you know, what's something that has changed the way you think about X, Y, Z? Uh, that kind of stuff will go a long way next year for the next event. Um, or, you know, something's even sooner, right? Just for building an audience for the podcast, even um, that that's going to go a long way. So as you're starting out, you may find that you need to rely more on uh, demonstration or, or experts. You know, there's, um, I'm sure as you were talking about this, I mean, essentially every guest on your podcast was you bringing in experts to talk about why this stuff is important, right? Correct. So even if you're in a new space, um, you can find experts who speak to the problem, even if there aren't experts who speak to your solution yet, right? So um, I'm trying to think, I mean, I can't think of something that's not invented. No, I mean, that's <laughs> Perfect answer. And that's exactly, yeah. what, and that's where I wanted to, that's where I went deep on education, right? Because there's yeah. a big, steep learning curve in this space and education is what we're all about. And I know sometimes it takes time, just like when people are on Shark Tank and they say, you got a problem. 
Yeah. You got to educate the whole world on this new technology, right? And sometimes yes. it takes time, but eventually you're going to get experts who, uh, like you said, maybe from academia that can stand to testify that this technology innovation or whatever is hot and new. Mm -hmm. Eventually you're going to have clients, even if they're beta testers who can, who yep. can, who can witness to the amazing facts of what you're doing. Yeah. Eventually you'll be able to put these check boxes together and say, here's the old way of doing it. Here's the new way of doing it. And here's the advantages. Mm -hmm. Right. And you'll be able mm -hmm. to tell those stories and just all this kind of works itself together. Right. It just yeah, it's time. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think just like you said, every stage of your business, you might find yourself relying on different things. You know, as you're, you may use types of podcasts than you do to drive registration for the event, than you do to drive re-engagement with those folks and retention, than you do, you know, for whatever else it is you do. It's, it's, you're going to find that this stuff can be useful in a bunch of different contexts. And it's just really important to be asking the question, like, what, how can I build trust in this scenario or for this audience or on this platform? And then use those types of content to, to go ahead and earn that trust. Uh, tell everybody what they can expect inside your book, Prove It, and then also tell them where they can find you if they want to connect with you on the socials. Yeah. So uh, if you want to learn more about Prove It, uh, our website is peoplewhoproveit.com. Um, but essentially, the book really walks through the five different common types of claims that your business may be making and then explains how you can use those three types of content that we talked about here uh, to go ahead and prove those different types of claims. Because different different types of content works better for different types of claims. You know, you may be claiming convenience or competence or something else. Um, so it's really it's super tactical. It's a quick read. Um, that's, that's sort of, sort of my MO. I don't, I don't want to sell you fluff. Like I just want you to get what you need so you can go out and, uh, and make a difference. So, uh, prove it exactly how modern marketers earn trust hopefully gets you everything you need to go out there and prove it yourself. And then if they want to reach out to you on the socials, do you have a preferred platform? Yeah. So, I mean, lucky for me, I'm very search optimized. So if you search for Melanie Diesel, you'll find me on your platform of choice. But uh, I spend the most time on Twitter where I'm M Diesel. Uh, and then again, my website is storyfuel.co. Storyfuel.co is sort of the, the home base for everything else. Melanie Diesel, thank you so much for answering my litany of questions. Uh, hopefully a lot of uh, wheels are moving in the minds of our audience. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks for letting me share my story.